Recognizing, reporting, and responding to child abuse. We all have a role to play in ensuring children and youth grow, learn, and develop in communities that are safe and nurturing. And as a trusted adult who interacts with children and youth on a regular basis, you can play a particularly significant role in recognizing signs of potential abuse and responding with care and confidence. This role can be challenging, and you might worry about getting involved. You may wonder, am I overreacting? How will it affect the child if I report it? What if I'm wrong? While these worries are understandable, it's always the right decision to say something if you suspect abuse. It is your legal responsibility to speak up, and this video will give you the knowledge and confidence to take the appropriate action when you suspect abuse. Over the next 15 minutes, you will learn how to recognize different types of abuse and signs of potential abuse, respond if a child or youth discloses they are being abused, report suspected abuse, and locate additional resources. By knowing how to recognize, report, and respond to suspected abuse, you can make the difference in a child or youth's life. Recognizing the signs of potential abuse. When a child experiences strong, frequent, and or prolonged trauma, such as physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or chronic neglect, a toxic stress response can occur. Toxic stress can disrupt the development of the brain and lead to difficulties with learning, memory, and forming strong, stable relationships. However, if intervention happens early when a child or youth is experiencing adversity, they will have better success in achieving positive outcomes and building resilience. This is why it's so important to recognize signs and symptoms of abuse and report them. There are four main types of abuse you need to be aware of and recognize the potential signs of each. These four types are neglect, physical, sexual, emotional. Neglect occurs when a caregiver or guardian is unable or unwilling to provide the child within their care the necessities of life, such as food, clothing, shelter, essential medical treatment, or adequate care or supervision. Signs a child or youth may be neglected can include unattended medical or dental concerns, consistent complaints of hunger, missed meals, or signs the child is underweight, unclean or unsuitable clothing for the weather, frequent absences from scheduled or planned activities, events, and appointments without explanation, disclosures of being home alone, being unsupervised when parents are home, or taking on adult responsibilities. Physical abuse is when a child is physically injured and there is a substantial and observable injury to any part of the body because of non-accidental use of force. Signs of physical abuse can include unexplained bruises or injuries, especially in various stages of healing, explanations of how the injuries happened that do not match what the injuries look like, extreme wariness of physical contact with adults, bruises or injuries covered with clothing that seems inconsistent with the weather or activity. Sexual abuse is when a child is inappropriately exposed or subjected to sexual contact, activity, or behavior, including sexual exploitation activities. When contact or touch is involved, the abuse may happen by improper touching in the sexual areas, including the mouth, breasts, buttocks, anus, and genital area, or when a child or youth is forced or asked to touch another person's sexual areas. Sexual abuse can also be non-contact and could involve such acts as convincing or forcing a child to listen to sexual talk or expose their sexual areas, or exposing a child to sexual activities or sexual body parts in person or through technology. Signs of sexual abuse from contact, touch, or non-contact may include Advanced sexual knowledge that most kids their age would not know. Sexualized behavior that is not consensual and is beyond the child or youth's age of development or continues despite being asked to stop. Another type of sexual abuse is sexual exploitation, which occurs when a child or youth is engaged in sex or sexual acts 
in exchange for money or drugs or for basic life necessities such as food, shelter, or protection. It also includes involving children or youth in creating pornography or sexually explicit websites or encouraging them to spread inappropriate photos of a sexual nature. Signs that a child or youth is being sexually exploited can include suddenly having many new unexplained material items, having much older boyfriends or girlfriends, frequently returning home late and or going missing for periods of time, spending more time on their screens and or concern with others seeing their screen. Emotional abuse is when a child's mental or emotional functioning or development is impaired because of such things as rejection, being deprived of affection or cognitive stimulation, being exposed to domestic violence or severe domestic disharmony, inappropriate criticism, threats, humiliation, expectations, or accusations, and negative exposure to someone in the home with a mental or emotional condition or chronic alcohol or drug use. A child or youth may be experiencing emotional abuse when they are often overly compliant, apologetic, or emotional, either boastful or very negative about themselves, including self-harm or suicidal thoughts and behaviors, having trouble concentrating or learning, complaining of stress-related conditions such as headaches or stomach aches. If you see one of these signs, it may not necessarily be an indicator that the child or youth is being emotionally abused. More often, signs of emotional abuse will come in clusters or in groups. Along with recognizing the signs of the four types of abuse we just reviewed, you need to be aware of other signs or symptoms that may indicate any type of abuse or a serious problem in a child's life. These signs can include sudden or extreme changes in performance, behavior, or emotion. Sudden changes in behavior or emotion, such as being fearful, withdrawn, or overly aggressive. Substance abuse or engaging in self-destructive activities. Not wanting to go home or running away from home. Any one or combination of these signs should heighten your suspicion of abuse and prompt you to take action. When discussing abuse, we must also recognize that abuse isn't always perpetrated by adults. Peer-on-peer -peer abuse occurs when there is any kind of physical, sexual, emotional, or coercive control exercised between a child or youth, either online and or offline, and can include, but is not limited to, bullying, including cyberbullying, abuse in intimate relationships, sexual violence, assault, and harassment, consensual or non-consensual sharing of nude or semi-nude pictures or video. What to do if you suspect abuse? According to the Child, Youth, and Family Enhancement Act, there must be reasonable grounds of suspected abuse for children and family services to become involved. But what are reasonable grounds? Abuse may be witnessed, or there are clear signs that lead you to have reasonable grounds to suspect child abuse. If this is the case, report it immediately, as the child or youth may be in imminent danger. More often, you will observe signs that raise suspicion. Trust your instinct that something could be wrong. You do not have to ask questions of the child or youth or have proof that your suspicions are correct to report the suspected abuse. It's simply enough that you believe something is wrong. If you are truly unsure about your suspicions, you can calmly initiate a conversation with the child or youth using open-ended questions. There is no harm in asking open-ended questions to create an opportunity for better understanding. For example, if you see bruises on a child or youth, you may ask, I notice you have a few bruises. How did that happen? Or, tell me how you got those bruises. They look sore. Try to avoid leading questions as they reflect assumptions and may result in a biased or skewed understanding. Examples of leading questions are, I noticed you have a few bruises. Who did that to you? Or, did your mom do that to you? During the conversation, allow the child or youth to speak freely. If you need a better understanding of the context, use phrases such as, tell me more. Be non-judgmental and remain calm during your conversation. Children and youth may also provide clues that something is wrong, including 
drawing a picture requiring explanation, dropping hints, or making concerning comments. Again, use open-ended questions to learn more and to guide you in deciding to report. Be mindful that a bruise on a child or youth or an unusual drawing by a child is not sufficient evidence for reporting. According to the Child, Youth, and Family Enhancement Act, there must be reasonable grounds of suspected abuse for children and family services to become involved. Reasonable grounds for reporting may result from a child or youth's explanation of how an injury was sustained and must be reported. Caregiver behavior may also raise concerns of potential abuse, such as consistently belittling or blaming a child or youth, viewing the child or youth as bad or burdensome, seeming unconcerned about their welfare, or appearing to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Once you have established reasonable grounds of suspected abuse, you do not need to ask further questions of the child or youth. It's your role to support them and report the suspected abuse, not to investigate. It is also your legal obligation to report suspected abuse to children and family services. What to do when a child or youth discloses abuse? When a child or youth discloses abuse, it's common for the listener to feel fear, disbelief, anger, or sadness. It's crucial that you set aside personal feelings and remain calm. Research indicates a child who feels supported and safe when disclosing abuse has optimal recovery outcomes. Reassure the child or youth that telling you was the right thing to do. You believe them and will need to tell someone who can help. Don't make promises you are unable to keep, such as keeping their disclosure a secret. As soon as possible, document any verbatim comments made by the child or youth. Gather demographic information for children and family services, such as the child or youth's full name, address, phone numbers, names of parents, caregivers, and siblings. Then make a call to report the suspected abuse. If you feel unable to report suspected abuse without support, ask a safe and trusted colleague to help with the call. You do not need permission to report, nor can anyone prevent you from reporting. It is your legal duty to report suspected child abuse. What happens after a report? Your role and legal obligation is to report suspected abuse. Possible outcomes of a report of suspected abuse are, the reported information is documented in the Children and Family Services system, but there is insufficient information to meet the criteria for child intervention involvement under the Act. You may be asked to continue to track and document your observations. The reported information is documented and it meets the threshold for involvement under the Act. If there are factors keeping the child or youth safe, child intervention will take no further action at this time. The reported information is documented and a decision is made that further assessment is needed. There are imminent safety concerns requiring an immediate child intervention response. Children and Family Services staff will thank you for your reported concerns. If the reported concerns move to an assessment phase, an assessor may reach out to you for more information. All child intervention matters remain confidential and will not be shared with a reporter. It's always the right decision to say something. Children and youth depend on all of us for their safety and well-being. If you suspect abuse, make the call. It's your legal responsibility. You don't need to have all the information. It is enough that you have reasonable grounds to be concerned. Reporting suspected child abuse ensures a child or youth has every chance to receive the intervention they need in support of their resilience and well-being. By working together to support young people, we are also supporting the potential healing for individuals and families that can span generations.